Welcome in to College Football Live. We are nearing the release of the first top 25 rankings from the College Football Playoff finally. Selection Committee. Yes, we're finally here. <laughs> the first of many rankings, 7 Eastern uh, tonight here on ESPN. And just a historical note, the last two years, no team outside the top six in the initial rankings uh, reached the college football playoff. So you want to be in the top four at the end, but it helps to be at or near the top at the start. Todd, what do you want to learn here tonight? What are you most eager for? Uh, I, I think number two. We all assume, and, and I think rightfully so, that Alabama is sitting in there number one. But you can make some arguments for three teams at that number two spot. Notre Dame, you know, the schedule is not nearly as strong as we thought it was coming into the year, but they still have, have quality wins. Michigan's probably the best win of all, all three of these teams in terms of opponents this year. They, you know, Stanford, Virginia Tech, not as strong as we thought, but still, quality wins. LSU has the loss, but they have easily the, the best schedule in terms of what they've beaten. Four teams that are power five teams with winning records, and, you know, they've been kind of grinding through and getting better and better as they go. And then Clemson has the worst resume, but an undefeated team, and just reeling the last couple of weeks in terms of things – coming together. Their defense has been unbelievable. Trevor Lawrence is starting to get into a groove. I think they've scored over 100 points and given up about 17 the last two weeks. So it's going to be interesting to see what the committee does with those three teams, David. Outscoring opponents by over 100 points in, in a three-game stretch is pretty solid. That's pretty solid. Um, you know, I, I really want to see if, if last year we saw down the stretch it really didn't matter about the record. In the end, they put in the best team because they thought it was the best. I want to see if they'll do that now. Go ahead and do it right now. Don't wait till the end of the season. Is LSU ranked two? Is LSU ranked three because you think they're a better team than Notre Dame? Don't, don't give me the so-and-so beat so-and-so beat so-and-so or they got a loss or whatever. Just I want to see if they'll go ahead and have that in several spots. I think you could have a two-loss team over a one-loss team, whether that be Penn State over West Virginia. LSU could be over an undefeated Notre Dame. If they're the better team, say it now, week one, when we start the rankings. Yeah, it's going, to be, it's going to be interesting to see. You mentioned it when it comes to, look, I test Alabama one, but resume, who would you put there? I mean, how would that ranking go if it's based on who you've beaten, David? You know, listen, I think if you, if you said that to me, LSU has done the most this season. Now, listen, I don't think those wins, that Miami win isn't as big as it was back then. I mean, Auburn win isn't as big as it was. You still beat Georgia by 20. You beat Michi uh, Mississippi State by, you know, 13 or 16. You, you, I think to go, to go to be a one-loss team, it's harder to do that schedule than to be undefeated where Alabama's at, to be undefeated where Notre Dame's at, to be undefeated where Clemson's at. To me, that's the hardest thing that's been done this year in college football. So, you know, listen, we have to use eye tests. We have to use who we think's better, and we have to use resume. That's why they all work hand-in-hand hand together to decide who the number one team is. Yeah, I, I agree with you, but I would say this. I think Clemson's the, the second-best team in the country. Just from, you know, watching the games and, and studying everything, I, when they're healthy and everything's right, I think they're the second best team because you've got a balanced football team. You've got a quarterback that's a playmaker and a difference maker. You've got a running back who has been outstanding in ETN all season long. They've got some young receivers that can step up, and they've got a defensive line that we've talked about all year. And, and I think Dexter Lawrence is playing as well as he has his entire career right now at defensive tackle. So finally healthy. Big I just, boy's finally healthy. Yeah, he's finally healthy. It's nice to yep. see. It's like a different football player than a year ago. So – in my opinion, I would say Clemson's number two. I think LSU might be the third best team, but I think from a resume standpoint, probably going to see Notre Dame ranked higher than, uh, than LSU and, and maybe even at the number two spot when it's all said and done tonight. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll see. It, it seems like Alabama, Clemson, and then remember, it's strength of schedule when the margins are slim. I, I, I would have to agree and, and think that the committee would say Bama and Clemson clear-cut top two. Then we'll start working in strength of schedule and, and all of those types of things. But I do wonder, you mentioned LSU, Notre Dame, Bama, Clemson, top four in some order. Who's the team that's just on the outside looking in? So the team that has the best argument, Todd, to be in the top four. I think it comes down to Michigan and Georgia. I really do. I think when, when you look at those two teams. Pick one, Todd. <laughs> okay, I'm working towards there. I'm not going to give away it's all It's a slow them. build. <laughs> Michigan and Georgia. Right now, I, it's, it's tough. I think Michigan probably has a slightly better resume. I think Georgia, if you were to say, okay, neutral field, these two teams, 
I think Georgia would win that football game. So that's the, that's the tough part of this. And I think then the other part is there's a big drop-off in my mind with the other teams. Oklahoma scares me to death because of Lincoln Riley, because of the explosive playmaking they have at your quarterback, and because of what they can do offensively. And they're getting a little bit better in terms of the defensive side since they fired Stoops a few weeks ago. But I think right now you have to look at Michigan and Georgia as, the, as five and six. You, you better listen to those footsteps because they're coming. Boomer Sooner, Todd, <laughs> last two weeks, they've held both opponents under 300 yards. That hasn't been done in years. More years. four <laughs> more uh, serious. Years and years upon years. More four down from them, by the way, which fits their personnel better. They're not a bunch of two-gap guys up front. They're not physical enough, and I don't think they're good enough. But you're right. That offense, the best play caller in college football, one of the most dynamic yep. players in college football, and the defense coming around, woo, they circling them wagons. And a, and a coach the Cleveland them. Browns would love to get right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he's good for now, though. For now, I'm good. good for now. Yes, it's a good another, tease. Until a You've seen the rundown. <laughs> yeah, wait till we get to the Bs. We'll, we'll talk about that okay, in, gotcha, in, gotcha. in a little bit. Uh, you guys, you mentioned a couple of those one-loss teams, Michigan, in Georgia. Can't argue with you there. But what about Washington State? Uh, not a great strength of schedule, especially in that non-con, but, but sitting there with one loss, David, are, are they a legitimate playoff contender at this point? I don't think so. Um, when I look at Washington State, first of all, if you're not fearing the stash, you have problems. I mean, he, he <laughs> literally, the dude's one of the best in the business. I mean, he is, he is. so much fun. I think he went 21 of 22 in the second half the other night. I mean, just... That dude, just, just watch 16 spin bean. You just, it's just fun to watch. But listen, they haven't beaten teams, any teams that are going to make you do anything. They, their best win is Oregon. Oregon was banged up to heck when they beat them. I mean, let's just be honest. They came off a big physical game with Washington, and they weren't the same team. I, I don't think Washington State's got staying power. Their offense does. But even the Stanford game, you watch that game, Todd? I mean, Stanford is a team yep. that's kind of finding themselves, period, and they still put up 38 on Washington State. So I think they're going to be right on the fringe, but I don't think they're going to be one of those teams that gets up in the top four. Yeah, and it seems like Coach Leach has – it's always one or two games in the second half of the season where they just – whether it's the defense or they don't show up, that they just can't sustain it consistently. I'll be interested to see because if they win out – you know, then you have to really look at this team and, and make the argument. Now, I understand Washington's not nearly as good as we thought. Stanford, the same thing. USC, all, Oregon, all the way down the line. Every time you think one of these Pac-12 teams is going to kind of emerge, they seem nope. to have a setback the next week. That's why I keep buying yeah. and selling and buying and selling this Pac-12 <laughs> stock all season long. But at the end of the day, I think we're all expecting Washington State to stumble at some point. If they don't, that obviously then it gets really interesting. Yeah, they've been hand, the Pac-12 has been handing the baton, and no one really wants it. The hot potato, here, you take it, right, you take right. it. No, I don't want it. We'll see if Washington State can hold on to a non-conference uh, schedule. Wyoming, Bad. San Jose State, and Eastern Washington, that's going to be that's going to be tough. Uh, look mm -hmm. at the first four years of the college football playoff. Seven of the last eight teams to make the college football playoff were in the top five of the initial rankings. And you can see it here with Georgia, Clemson, Oklahoma, Alabama last year, all in the top five. So how many in the top four tonight will be in the top four at season's end? David, start with you. Okay, I will go with Alabama. I'll go with Clemson. That's two. And that's it. I'll go with two. That's it. All I'll right. go with two. I, I yeah, think I you'll have... Say. I think you'll have stuff. Obviously, Alabama and LSU are kind of going to take care of themselves, but I'll, I'll say those two. I agree. I agree. I, they, I know LSU. What's interesting is is LSU. If LSU wins, then then you, it's hard to see them not wind up in the in the playoff against LSU Alabama. LSU winning is a nightmare. LSU winning is a nightmare scenario for everyone outside the SEC. Yes, it for is everyone because, else, exactly. Because if LSU Bama still wins, in. Bama's That's still it. there. That's it. And Bama's <laughs> excited about it. We get an extra out. week yeah. off. 
<laughs> it's, I mean, Nick Saban, no one thinks this way, of course, but if you were just to kind of take a step back and look at it, the best thing that could happen to Bama is you lose that game, win out, you get an extra week, wow. ready to go, fresh legs, and then go play. Because you, you know they're still in. There's no question but, about but, it. But that's if LSU runs the table, because LSU could still lose to, uh, right. to Texas A&M, and Alabama would be obviously in the no mix question. because they lost to Florida from the Eastern, but it would still count it to be two Todd, losses I want you, one. Todd, I want you to tell Nick Saban the best thing to happen to his team would be to lose mm-hmm. to LSU. Just see what he's saying. Yeah, that, that will be saying. a very short that meeting on, on a Friday. You guys and your <laughs> media and your rat poison. Your media. Rat, media. rat, rat poison. No. poison. <laughs> All you're saying. Uh, that leads us to uh, our Capital One uh, fan vote as we ask you, uh, which of these teams, which contender is most likely to lose this week? We got Bama, Notre Dame, Michigan, Georgia. What do you think, David? Um... I will go Michigan. I, I'm a, I, I'm believing in their defense, but I also am a huge believer in Penn State's offense. I mean, Penn State's offense is really good. I feel like they're going to score points. So Michigan's offense is going to have to come to play. All right. That's uh, David Pollock's vote. You can vote. Watch out for well. Northwestern. We've got much more to get to. Watch out. Hey, Northwestern's pulled that upset before. Up next, the latest from Maryland and the Board of Regents, their decision to recommend retaining head coach D.J. Jerkin and athletic director Damon Evans and a couple of head coaches trying to get their teams to the playoff, but maybe some distractions there. Call for concern with Urban Meyer and Lincoln Riley. It's next. Mayhem. Look at the Maryland timeline of events. Of course, June 13th when Jordan McNair died after suffering heat stroke at a team workout. And a couple of months later, following an ESPN report, Uh, that described a culture of player mistreatment. Head coach D.J. Durkin was placed on administrative leave. Strength and conditioning coach Rick Court resigned. And then the Maryland Board of Regents today recommending that Maryland retain the head football coach D.J. Durkin and athletic director Damon Evans following an investigation. David Pollack, your reaction to that recommendation? Well, I mean, listen, this this situation has been horrible. And nobody feels bad for for most of the people except for Jordan McNair. And he's the one that really matters the most in this whole thing. And I I find it very hard to believe that I I did not think that we would get this outcome. I didn't think that something like this would happen and you would continue to have the same leadership in place when something that awful happens. This wasn't something that was minor. This was a death by a young man. And so now – the AD comes back and the coach comes back, but obviously, unfortunately, Jordan McNair doesn't get that opportunity. So it's, um, it's not what I expected, that's for sure. Todd, the coach comes back, uh, according to the recommendation, but comes back to what? I mean, Adam Rittenberg, ESPN, ESPN.com, uh, football reporter, uh, citing sources that said that D- Durkin met with his team and players today, and a few of them, including starters, walked out of the meeting today. What, what's next for Maryland? This is going to be obviously very difficult to overcome. I mean, that to me is the strongest message sent. Can you imagine you're, you're told basically, you know, it's not definitive, but everything is telling us that DJ Durkin's going to be the head coach. So you're told that your boss is going to be back and he's the guy and you're going to walk out of a meeting when he comes in the room. I mean, that's wow. how much emotion is, is involved in this situation. So that, to me, tells you everything you need to know about how difficult this is going to be moving forward if Durkin and his players are going to get on the same page and become a team again or if this just is not going to work. And that, that, that's the first step, step in the direction of it's not going to work. I mean, th- let's Correct. be honest. Like, the, the players, you have to respect who your, who your coach is. You have to – if you don't have that, you have nothing as a program. And – so this is the first step. But guess what else is about to get involved? Social media is going to get involved. Everybody's going to have an opinion. So I don't think this is a final verdict. I think there's going to be many voices that are going to weigh in on this. And the future is still going to be uncertain because if the players refuse to play for a coach, you, 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 you have to remove the coach. There's nothing you can do about that. Yeah, yeah. How do, you, how do you recruit guys to play for a team when some guys on the team don't want to play for that coach? What message does that send? I, I don't know how you operate in that environment. Uh, Maryland, the Maryland story, one of two stories in the Big Ten that dominated the month of August with uh, D.J. Durkin and head coach for Ohio State, Urban Meyer, placed on administrative leave. Of course, Urban Meyer back with Ohio State, but continues to answer questions about his future like he did on Monday. Plan on coaching. Plan on coaching? Yes. Um, you say for sure you'll be back next year at Ohio State? Are the games getting to you? 
The games have gotten me for 30 yeah. years. I know. So is that anything different? Is that <laughs> is that just how it is? We're not, maybe... we're, we're not playing well, and, and uh, you know, I, I'm one of those guys. I want to help fix the issue, and uh, like all coaches do. Now, Urban Meyer did tell reporters today that he has a cyst on his brain that was first diagnosed in 1998, causes severe headaches, and was responsible for him being brought to his knees in the win against Indiana. Let's do a little calmer little concern here. Todd, start with you. Calmer concern about Urban Meyer's future there at Ohio State. Well, I think there's concern about the product that we, that we see on the field and what's going on at Ohio State. I feel like we're, this has become repetitive almost weekly. We're saying... Dave and I have said, and a lot of other people say, it just it doesn't feel right. He doesn't seem like himself. I've gotten to know Urban when he was working at ESPN. I spent time at his, at his house with his wife and family, you know, every single week. So I know him, and I know that he's struggling through this, and I know that this, there's, this has been a very challenging year, maybe the most challenging of his career. But you, when you look at the product on the field, David, something just doesn't feel right. Even in the wins against Minnesota and Indiana, they weren't, the same Ohio State that we've gotten used to seeing year after year. So uh, there's concern with that. I do think, though, that he will be back. This will not be his last year. I'll be very surprised, I should say, if this is his last year as the head coach at Ohio State. I think all this stuff wears on you. I mean, being a yep. coach isn't easy. And then you have to listen to – well, then you go through the ordeal he went through. And listen, he put himself through that. I'm not saying feel sorry for Urban Meyer, but – it also adds weight on your shoulders on top of losing now and all this stuff. I, I honestly thought, Todd, when the verdict came out, I thought that there would be a chance this would be his last year regardless just because – you know what else happens? Not only does the weight come down and, the, and, and everybody starts to question everything, but now also if you're Urban Meyer – you have to every you have to answer every question about this all the time. Recruiting is going to be very difficult. People are going to continue to dig and dig and dig to try to find stuff on Urban Meyer because he lied to the media. That is, that's going to continue to happen. Yep. So I would not be surprised if this was his last year at Ohio State and he either walked away or found a different challenge. And think about it. We talked about recruiting earlier, answering those questions. How long are you going to be here, coach? Two years? Three? Will you be there the whole time I'm there? Those are things other programs can certainly use against him. Uh, Meyer, not the only coach dealing with speculation about his future. Uh, after the Cleveland Browns job opened up on Monday, <laughs> Oklahoma head coach Lincoln Riley was almost immediately asked if he's considered a jump to the NFL. Not right now. I, You know, you sit there and answer these questions and – I always want to be truthful. Um, the truth is for me is I love Oklahoma. Uh, I love coaching here. I love college football. I certainly don't have that itch right now. Uh, I don't know that I ever will, but I'm never going to be a guy that's going to stand up here and say, no way, no how will any of these things ever happen. I, I, I don't know that. Love the honesty. Love the candor Not there. But, there, but right he didn't now. refute it. Yeah, he didn't <laughs> refute it. He didn't slam the door. David, uh, calmer concern with Sooners losing Lincoln Riley to the NFL. I, I don't think it's just the NFL. Everybody wants this cat. Whether it be any other yeah. college program across <laughs> the country that wants to come steal him, he's, he's an innovator. He's a genius. He's a savant. Whatever word you want to get him. If I'm, taking, if I'm doing a draft pick of offensive coordinators across college football, he's my number one pick, and it ain't close. So, Turn in the of card. Course, of course I would be nervous <laughs> if, I was, if I was the Sooners because he's that good. Well, and here's the, the beauty of Lincoln Riley, and you, I know you know him and you've spent time with him. He's, he's a, the genius, the savant, all those things you said, but he's also real. And how few yeah. guys are there out there that have that kind of offensive or defensive mind and the mind for football, but also normal dudes. And you can sit down and talk to like any, anybody else, any one of your friends. And I think that's part of why he's so successful is that he yep. can sit in a living room and recruit. He can talk to his players and relate, but he also then goes and, and sits down and starts looking at play calling and plays and offensive, you know, offensive innovation. And he looks at it, you know, in a way that most other coaches in the country do not. And that's what makes him so special. Yeah. yeah that's a, that's a great point. He's very real. And what else is real is his, Bond that he has with Baker Mayfield, who happens to be the quarterback for the Cleveland Browns. We'll, we'll see I'm what not happens. Leaving. I'm not going to March. Cleveland. I'm not leaving no. this situation. <laughs> right. Oklahoma nah, uh, might be a better job. Uh, Penn State Williams, Devin White, and Jonah Williams as well. Todd, you got 10 seconds here. How, how nice a game is this going to be draft-wise? Well, 
two things. Seven of the top 32 are from these two teams. 19 of 32 from the SEC. And Pollock, I got to tell you, you killed it this segment. <laughs> Great. Best he's ever sounded. Seven Eastern ESPN <laughs> rankings. <laughs>